They tell me that Meghan and Harry are popular in America. I suppose in flyover uh, country, nobody much pays them any mind. But on the east and west coasts, I can see how, why Meghan and Harry have become Hollywood favorites, chat show, sofa TV favorites. I have no favorite in the royal family. For me, the feud between Harry and William is two bald men fighting over a throne, a comb. It is of no interest to me who said what to whom inside the royal family because I believe in a republic and I'm going to make the case to you now, right now, that those of you who are hottest under the collar about the madness of Harry and Meghan are the most vociferous supporters of the institution of monarchy. So ponder this. But for an accident of chronology of birth, Harry would have been your king and Meghan would have been your queen. They would have become the head of state of Britain. And yet you continue to leave to the capriciousness of the chronology of the birthing suite the idea of a hereditary head of state, the idea of an hereditary monarchy. Maybe, just maybe, who knows? William is the strong, silent type. Maybe, who knows? He can keep it in his pants. Maybe, who knows? He's going to be a wholesome father figure for the nation. I have my doubts about that, but maybe you're right, in which case you dodged a bullet. Do you want to take that risk again and again and again? You want your country in perpetuity to be in thrall to the roulette wheel of a head of state that isn't bonkers? Now, leaving aside Netflix, Bonanza, with this latest, they, they spent a fortune on the crown. I doubt if they ever got that budget back, but they're sure quids in with Meghan and Harry in the latest soap opera on their brand on Netflix. Leaving aside the idea of Americans thinking the British are racist, that's a bit rich, I've got to tell you. With love to all our American viewers, a country that exists on the bones of a hundred million indigenous Americans whom they massacred and robbed, and then a country built on the literal, enchained enslavement of millions of black Africans that until the 1960s still didn't allow a black man to piss in the same pot as a white man in a public restaurant, didn't allow little Richard to stay in the hotel that he was performing in, wouldn't let Sammy Davis Jr. stay in the same hotel as Dean and Frank. Spare me your sanctimony about racism. The country that bought us the George Floyd incident is not in a position to lecture anybody about racism. And as I've always said, not here for the first time, if you think Britain is racist, you've never lived in France or the Netherlands or many other European countries. And I didn't even compare us to the United States of America for that comparison would be frankly ridiculous. Leaving aside that although the British royal family are now routinely accused of racism by Meghan and Harry, they actually never give a single example of that racism. And the examples that they give are actually the reverse of examples of racism. As I've said many times before, somebody asking what Meghan and Harry's children would look like is not making a racist statement. And if they are, my entire family and my wife's entire family are guilty of racism because all of them endlessly wondered what Gayatri and my children would look like. It's normal to wonder 
what the children of a mixed race couple would look like. Although Meghan herself is mixed race and the blackness of Meghan Markle's beginning to pale a little if you get my drift. But leaving aside the fact that they have not adumbrated a single example that passes any serious test of racism of the royal family, I say I damn them all. A plague on all of their houses, palaces, castles, and everything else that the British taxpayer is paying for, and not just paying for, but currently paying to heat. An Arctic winter just hit my country of Britain, and our people are in no position to resist it. They are in no position to warm their houses. Uh, their economic situation has passed from grave to critical. We are living on the edge of an ice age here in Britain and in Europe. And frankly, the last thing we should be talking about is the prince and princess of Montecito, whose palace in the Netflix documentary isn't even their palace. It's actually shot in a $42 million property that's up for sale. Netflix just rented it. But the impression is given that the king and queen of Montecito are waiting over the water for the day when a grateful nation asks them to come back and perhaps usurp the rightful heirs to the throne. Or only rightful, of course, because they murdered a couple of children in the Tower of London. Ever hear of the princes of the Tower? Anyone? Matt Hancock, I have nothing personally against. I've only ever met him once. I sat in Parliament with him for some years. He was distinctly unprepossessing. If he and I walked along a corridor, nobody would have been looking at Matt Hancock in the uh, in the spectacle, in the parade, he was a nothing burger, a nobody. But I did appear on BBC Question Time with him once in Gillingham, as I recall, and tore him a new one. I was amazed at the shrinkage of the political class implicit in the rise and rise and rise of Matt Hancock. But it came as no surprise to me that he turned out to be a catastrophic failure. It did come as a surprise that his publican got a 20 plus million pound contract to supply PPE, which may or may not have been amongst the nine billion pounds worth of PPE that turned out to be completely worthless. It may be that the publican ends up in the dock along with Michel Moan, the conservative Peer, how, what about an uplift, Michel? That's the uplift, that's the balcony bra of all corruption stories that you are now involved in, and I understand you're now living in Latin America. And it may be that you will not be able to come back. I was not surprised that Hancock completely and utterly failed the nation and is responsible for at least prima facie, the deaths, unnecessary deaths, of many, many thousands of my fellow citizens. As I've said often, I don't want to see Matt Hancock in the jungle, on the television. I want to see him in the dock at the Old Bailey, charged with, at minimum, corporate manslaughter, criminal negligence. I hold him and his cabinet colleagues and the opposition front bench that backed them every inch of the way, responsible for the unnecessary demise of so many of my fellow citizens. But I've got to say he hadn't touched bottom yet. Matt Hancock is about to become the face of a new campaign, which if you think about it, was ineluctable. A campaign to persuade us of the right to die. A campaign to persuade us of the joys of euthanasia. A campaign to pave the way 
from the semi-legal euthanasia that is currently being practiced in children's wards as well as in elderly wards in Britain today to the full pomp and ceremony of a legal euthanasia regime. Matt Hancock, I suppose he had to do something posthumous to his parliamentary career, but to become the new face of the ultimate capitalist campaign. People say to me, what do you mean capitalist campaign? If capitalism was a person, the person it would choose to murder is the person who will never again turn a cent of profit, who will only ever again be in the debit column as a cost, who will only ever again be a burden on the rest of us and on the rest of society. And Hancock's going with the grain because if you think about the individualization of society, the atomization of society, the death of religion, the death of organized socialist politics, then why not shuffle your elderly parents off to an elderly grave? After all, they're suffering, aren't they? They're a burden, aren't they? You can make them feel like they are a burden. That's for sure, I discovered. Just the other day, my mother is sitting with an electric blanket plugged into the wall around her all day rather than put her heating on. A situation I hope to have corrected. But parents, grandparents, can easily be persuaded that they are merely a burden to the living. And from the point of view of the capitalist state, of course the cost of keeping elderly people alive until they're in their 80s, even 90s, even more, if you're in the royal family, then why wouldn't you want to encourage a state of mind amongst the chronically sick, amongst the severely handicapped, amongst the very elderly, weak and vulnerable and feeble, the ones that Matt Hancock shunted into old people's homes, to die themselves and kill other people because he couldn't keep them in the hospital because the hospital was in such a state that my youngest child had to be born in a rubber bathing pool at the bottom of my bed in my bedroom because it wasn't safe for my wife to give birth in Matt Hancock's NHS. Elon Musk is doing the world a signal service. Who would have thunk that a billionaire who paid $44 billion for a $10 billion company would end up owning the house of horrors and then open all its windows and its doors to the rest of us so we can see what the so-called achingly liberal, achingly progressive pussy hat brigade had done to the public square. One that they boasted was a boon to humanity, but which turns out to have been a political conspiracy for their liberal, progressive pussy hat politics. Every page that's turned in the Twitter files is completely horrifying, or ought to be. It's ignored in the so-called mainstream media because they're run by almost exactly the same kind of people as were running Twitter. And insofar as they manage to get outraged at what is in the Twitter files, they're outraged at the opening of the books, not what's in the books. Full disclosure, I am myself probably in February meeting Mr. Musk in court in Dublin, the jurisdiction of the company's headquarters, don't you know? They picked it for tax reasons. They didn't figure on having to meet me in the four courts of Dublin.
but they will in February. And the window for Mr. Musk to mediate an end to this dispute of the false and defamatory labeling of me on my Twitter account, which has now libeled me more than 100 million times. That's quite a circulation, Mr. Musk. That's quite a width of libel. And if the judge decides that the width of the libel must be reflected in the final outcome of the case, your company is in very, very big, big trouble. And even a fleet of Teslas will not now solve this legal matter between us. But that notwithstanding, I have no quarrel with Musk. Musk is going through the Augean stable of Twitter, like Hercules. He's at least going through it with the stiffest of brooms and exposing it to the disinfectant of sunlight. And what do we see? We see the grotesque figures of Hillary Clinton, of Michelle Obama, of the Secretary General of the State of Arizona, of sundry FBI officers all over the country in direct communication with a media company giving it orders, orders which were complied with in direct contradiction to the American Constitution. The First Amendment of the American Constitution makes every one of those actions an illegal act, an act, you might say, of rebellion an act of treason against the Republic of vastly greater significance than a group of men in Buffalo Indian hats and necklaces dancing around the Congress on January 6th. I keep hearing the Liberals talking about Trump having unleashed violence on January the 6th when the events of January the 6th would be a quiet Saturday afternoon on the Champs-Élysées when the French yellow vests are on the march and the French riot police are laying into them. Only two people died on January 6th and both of them were killed by law enforcement. But as Goebbels discovered long ago, if you repeat a lie often enough, people begin to believe it. Musk, I take my hat off to you, but I'll still see you in court in February in Dublin. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night, as Betty Davis once said. And boy, have I got a power couple for you coming up next.